now from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. The Florida legislature begins its 60-day session on Tuesday. Governor Ron DeSantis has laid out an ambitious agenda on a number of major issues, including the environment, education, and health care. His budget would spend a record amount of money, $91.3 billion, and it increases spending for almost every state agency. But that agenda has to go through the House and the Senate, and arguably the most powerful person in the legislature is the Speaker of the House, Miami's very own Jose Oliva. A Republican who represents the Miami Lakes area, Oliva is the first House Speaker from South Florida since Marco Rubio held that post more than a decade ago. When Marco Rubio was named Speaker, he traveled around the state doing interviews and raising his profile. He even wrote a book laying out 100 big ideas he hoped to accomplish. Now, by comparison, Jose Oliva is more of a mystery. His family made their fortune producing and selling cigars. Politically, he is seen as conservative with a libertarian point of view. But he hasn't sought a lot of attention, and the public has not heard him speak about his views on many major issues. Well, this morning, that changes. In his first extensive TV interview, the new speaker discusses a wide range of topics, and his views are likely to shock many. We ended up talking for more than 30 minutes, and the full interview is on CBSMiami.com. On today's show, though, we'll cover guns, education, marijuana, and abortion. We started with me asking the speaker what he hoped to accomplish over the next two years. The most pressing issue, there are many, but the most pressing is health care. Without a doubt, the cost of health care are a, a runaway train. When I was elected in 2011, it was about 33 percent of our budget, which is significant, of course. This year, it'll be about 48 percent. It's growing at a rate faster than anything else, certainly faster than revenues, and still we have 600,000 people without coverage. And so the real issue is not how much of a commitment we've made to spending money on health care. The issue is the cost of health care. What is causing uh, the cost of health care to continue to skyrocket, and that's what we'll be focusing on. And what do you believe the reasons for the skyrocketing cost of health care are? There, there are multiple, but, uh, but chief among them is the hospital set. Setting. Hospitals uh, have become these giant monopolies and conglomerates due in part to government regulation that allowed them to have monopolies, in fact, that almost insisted that they be the only hospital in a given area. Over the years, these hospitals have started to acquire doctor's offices around them, diagnostic centers around them. They self-refer to their own diagnostic centers, and, and they've taken patients from these, from these doctor's offices they buy. They, in, in essence, have created a monopoly. The other issue is the great complication of health care makes it to where they can charge anything and people feel like, well, it must somehow be justifiable. Well, in, in, in the large amount of cases, it isn't. It's just, it's outright price gouging and we have to get to the bottom okay, of it. Okay, so how do you break up what you call a monopoly? How do you break that up? You begin by undoing some of what was done. There, the, the issue of certificate of need, is, or as we know it as CON, is the, the regulation that says that in order for someone to open a new hospital, there must be considered a need for a hospital. We don't do that anywhere else in our society. Florida has has rejected the Medicaid expansion mm -hmm. dollars to come into the state. Yeah. Why not take those dollars that would cover somewhere upwards of 800,000 people and at least give them some health care, take dollars as opposed to turning those dollars away? Well, I, I would tell you, it, the level of health care that they will get is minimal because many doctor's offices don't take Medicaid. Isn't minimal the, better than nothing? Well, th th it depends. Is if, if minimal as a Band-Aid today is better than nothing tomorrow when the price continues to skyrocket, Skyrocket. See, here's the challenge in the most basic terms. If we were to say that every citizen has a right to a particular item, and we'd say the state should buy this item for you, whatever you want it to be. Uh, but that item now begins to go from $100 to $1,000 to $10,000 to $100,000. Your issue is not buying that item for the consumer. Your issue is why, what is driving up this cost? And the more government money we pour into it, half of our budget now in Florida, the higher the price continues to go. 
and, exp and a Medicaid expansion would do what it did in other states. You would still have a lot of people getting their health care in an emergency room, particularly to these standalone emergency rooms that purport themselves to be almost primary care. And you would not have any additional quality. We, we have to go right at the cost side of this. For decades now, the price has been increasing and increasing, and we've kicked the can down the road. It is now half of Florida's budget. We have a commitment to health care. We wouldn't spend half our money if we didn't. But we have to stop the cost side of it. How would you describe yourself politically? Well, I, I think it, for me it's quite simple, and that is uh, I think people should be able to make the decisions that they would like to make for themselves. I don't want to encumber uh, someone's ability to make their decisions. I don't want to tell anyone how to live their lives. I also think that when government gets involved in something, and, and, and there is so much proof of this as to almost be indisputable, the minute government gets involved in something, it makes it more complicated and it makes it more expensive. And usually the loser is the citizen. The two examples, not to get back to health care, but health care and education. The two areas where government has gotten deeply involved is in health care and in education. And the two areas that are the most expensive for any American, not just in this state, in all states, is health care and education. My view is that the private market handles things because interests are aligned in a more efficient and better way. We all have uh, technology in our pockets, which is greater than what it took to put a man on the moon in 1969. If your guiding philosophy is to keep government out of people's lives, mm -hmm. Do you believe that a woman has a right to decide the fate of her own body when it comes to issues such as whether or not to have an abortion? Well, the challenge there is that there are two lives involved. So where I believe that uh, we should stay out of people's lives, I don't believe that people's lives should be taken. And so the, the real, and, and, it's, and it's a complex issue because one has to think, well, there's a host body and that host body has to have a certain amount of rights because at the end of the day, it is that body that, that g carries this entire other body to turn. But there's an additional life there. And the, the, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, in, in protection of life, and we do that in all our laws, all parties protect life, uh, what, uh, to what is the limit to which we are going to give one person complete power over the life of another? It's a complicated issue. I, I wish it would fit neatly into, into uh, libertarian thinking the way a lot of other things do. The truth is it doesn't. So but there if, are two lives involved. So if Roe versus Wade is overturned, or if states are allowed more control over this issue, would you favor banning abortions in the state of Florida? What, what I would favor is, one, understanding viability. So uh, we have to look at a couple of things. In, 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 the, in a situation of incest, rape, I mean, they're, they're one and the same. But in, in those types of situations, traumatic experiences, minors that are raped and impregnated, uh, we're talking about there, there are deep psychological effects there. And, and we have to look at, is one life worth more than the other there? But, what we, but make no mistake about it. We are making a decision between two lives. Lives. And so I, I don't want to disguise it. What I'm saying is that in the event Do you of, believe life begins at, in, at conception? I believe science believes that. I mean, the only definition of science of life is, is something that grows. From the moment that conception occurs, there begins to be growth. And so scientifically, that's what it is. The, but that's not the question. The question is, what is the value of that life? And is it subordinate to the value of its host body? So it's a question of viability then? What, do you so, in other words, you would allow abortion up until the point where, where the fetus was viable. No, I, I, what I've said is that if if the life of the mother is in danger, or in the case of a minor who has been raped or, or the victim of incest rape, uh, the, the the mental uh, the mental capacities of that person are are deeply in danger. Those are things we should look at. But viability is also very important. As technology moves along, a, a, a human body can exist outside of its host body earlier and earlier. And so then one has to think, to what time does the host body have veto power over this other life? You realize there are a lot of people who will hear you use phrases like host body and say to you, that's a woman. That's a person. Yeah. That's not a, that's, a, you know, you're, 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 you're sort of creating a scenario where you're looking at that, that not so much as a person, but as a host body. Well, yeah, but, and, um, but uh, you, you understand that when this discussion is being had, the fetus is also a person, and that is being seen as a fetus. And so it, we can either use technical terms on both sides or we can just use both lives. I'd, I'd be happy to do either. The real question is, there are two lives. There is a weight and a quality to both. Both need protection. 
What is that balance? Let me ask you this. Do you see bills talking about the issue of abortion and viability coming up in this session? I think that they will because of what we've seen nationally. And I so what do you where, where do you what do you think is, is likely to pass the House and what would you support and what would you oppose? I would support things that are consistent with other laws. So in, in the state of Florida, uh, you cannot get a marriage license without a cooling off period of a couple of days just to make sure that two adults, two two capable adults are required to take some time. You're required to take a certain amount of time before you buy a firearm, uh, just in the event that you're making a bad decision for yourself. These are adults, uh, and, and so w without any suspicion that this is a bad decision, you're supposed to take this time. Uh, we don't. We we feel that it is an offense to ask someone before ending another life to take a time and think about it, to fully understand what it is, to well, share the information. So I think I would like something that is consistent with other things we do in our state. The assumption that you're making, though, is is that the woman has not given thought to it, that has not weighed her options, considered it before walking into a clinic and and making that choice. So it, it, you see what I'm saying. In other words, you're saying that after. Some people will hear that and say to themselves, oh, the woman has already made that choice, wrestled with those decisions, decided this is what's in her best interest, walked into a, walked into a facility, and now is being told you have to turn around, go home, and come back in 48 or 72 hours. And, and the same argument can be made for a marriage license. The same argument could be made for uh, the purchase of a gun. We, we're making assumptions that perhaps we probably should not make. But one thing that we have said as a state is, in these cases, uh, we're asking you to give it some thought because we think there, are, there is some measure of gravity. And, uh, and what we're also saying is, we'd like to provide you with as much information as possible. After Oliva's comments were first broadcast Thursday evening on CBS 4 News, Oliva issued the following statement. In a recent interview where the very controversial topic of abortion was raised, I used the term host to describe a pregnant woman. It was an attempt to use terminology found in medical ethics writings with the purpose of keeping the discussion dispassionate. The reaction undoubtedly shows it had the exact opposite effect. I apologize for having caused offense. My aim was the contrary. This is and will continue to be our society's greatest challenge. I strongly believe both mother and child have rights and the extent and balance of those rights remain in question. I regret my wording has distracted from the issue. My apologies to all. More of my interview with Jose Oliva when we come back.